I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Oscar Films. And this week, we're going to be looking at the 1993 Oscars, the Schindler's List Oscars, or maybe more aptly named the Steven Spielberg Oscars, and a movie that represents the sort of Irish new wave of cinema that I think has sort of been forgotten to just a historical relic instead of the great movie that it actually is. That movie, of course, being In the Name of the Father. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is pick a movie that was nominated for Best Picture that I believe to be forgotten to time. A movie that isn't as well remembered or talked about or appreciated that maybe should be or just unfortunately has been kind of relegated to a historical moment rather than an actually beloved movie. Um, and the show is broken down into three parts. The first part being that historical context. Because we're going year by year, we talk about the Oscars, why this movie was nominated for Best Picture, was it even a surprise at the time, kind of this historical context where we were at the time, why we nominated this movie. Um, then for most of these movies, I'm seeing them for the very first time, so I like to give my thoughts and a little bit of a critical evaluation on the movie because maybe the reason why it's forgotten is because it's not a very good movie. You know, sometimes that's the unfortunate situation unfortunate situation. Um, and then finally, at the end of the video, trying to answer that age old question as to why this movie was forgotten and not one of the other ones. But like I said at the top of the show, this really was the Steven Spielberg Oscars. Not only does he direct Schindler's List, which goes on to win Best Picture and win seven Oscars, including his first Best Directing Oscar, he also directs Jurassic Park in the same year, and that wins three Oscars in and of itself. So, I mean, we have 10 awards for a Steven Spielberg uh, movie, and, you know, this was really the, the, the crowning, the coronation of him being the king of Hollywood because he was able to make the artsy, sort of well-respected historical drama, but also the big blockbuster that he's known for, and do both at such a high elite level. So... Schindler's List was the movie that is arguably the definitive Holocaust movie from arguably the greatest director of all time. This is arguably his best movie of all time. You know, it's number six on IMDb. So it's a well-appreciated, well-beloved, well-respected movie that's still well-remembered. Um, so I didn't want to cover that. Uh, we also have The Fugitive, which was released this year, which is peak 90s Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones, which still has all-time movie quotable lines. Um, it is kind of crazy to think about, you know, a movie like The Fugitive, if it was released today, wouldn't even be considered for a, a Best Picture nomination. But it's crazy to think that, you know, sort of a 90s action thriller at the time was so well-beloved and watched that people were like, hey, let's just nominate it for Best Picture. You know, that kind of stuff it would be so rare to happen. Um, but I didn't want to cover that movie because I'd seen it before and it's showing on TV all the time and it's kind of a class, classic kind of 90s action thriller kind of a movie, like I said, with those quotable lines that are still well remembered. This is also the year of Jane Campion's The Piano and while Jane Campion is a bit of an irregular filmmaker, she's still a well-respected and beloved filmmaker. Her movie the, movie, the Power of the Dog, I think is going to be an Oscar contention this year, so we should be sort of aware of that. Um, so she's still a, a filmmaker who's well-respected and still makes movies that are well-claimed and still get Oscar love as we're predicting this year. Um, but, but The Piano, I will also argue, is maybe her most signature movie. So. It's still well remembered, even if Jane Campion can sometimes be a little bit, like I said, a regular or hit or miss or sometimes, you know, she has a little bit of a stranger career in my opinion. And then the other movie I was considering doing was The Remains of the Day. But that was kind of a Merchant Ivory movie that I, I, I instead, instead sort of punted to next week. So this episode and next week ep episode are kind of uh, sister episodes in the sense that there are two kind of uh, film movements, we'll call them, at this time that were really popular at the time that I think have been less so over the years. So, you know, this year I'm going to be talking about the Irish New Wave and kind of the I I Irish cinema that we get that really sort of transferred for the very first time in this period of time. Um, and then next week we're going to be talking about the Merchant Ivory movies that have continued to, throughout this period in the late 80s and through the 90s, really do well. Um, and then ultimately, I guess that culminates with uh, James Ivory winning for Call Me By Your Name. But we'll talk about that next week. This week, I want to talk about what's only loosely referred to as the Irish New Wave. It's not really a, a term in the sense that the French New Wave or Italian neorealism. It's kind of like this uh, stranger period in, in Oscar history, but a period in which Ireland really sort of blossoms onto the map where we get great Irish movies and playwrights and, and actors, and it really starts to come together for, for the country. 
Starting mostly in 1989, Jim Sheridan, the director of this movie, does My Left Foot, which gets nominated for Best Picture and Best Director, and gets Daniel Day-Lewis, his first Oscar. Daniel Day-Lewis is also an Irish actor, so it's like, okay, wow, we get this amazing new actor with this great director. Um, Neil Jordan really comes onto the game the year earlier, 1992, with The Crying Game, so that sort of blossoms. Of course, the 90s period in you know Irish economics is referred to as the Celtic Tiger because it was a booming period um, for Irish. Ireland as, as a country. You also get someone like Martin McDonough at this time really starting to do his, uh, he's a, he was a playwright at this time, he's really starting to develop his plays and show his plays in Dublin and whatnot. Of course, we don't know Martin McDonough did Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, which was a huge Oscar movie, did, you know, in Bruges, and, you know, he's still a well-respected um, director and, and playwright. Um, but, like I said, we also got these great actors, Daniel Day-Lewis and Liam Neeson and Brendan Gleeson, and, you know, it was really a sort of a, a rich time for Irish culture, and it was really resonating here. I mean, we're talking about My Left Foot, 1989. A couple of years later, Crying Game gets nominated for Best Picture. The next year, we have In the Name of the Father. Um, the Boxer was another sort of Oscar movie that doesn't necessarily translate, but you know, we get a Michael Collins about a great Irish kind of a revolutionary leader. So we do get these movies uh, in, in this period of time, and I think In the Name of the Father is kind of a great representation of that. Because it was really this wave of people going like, oh, hey, the Irish cinema is really terrific and great, and we're getting these great talents here, let's reward them. So in that sense, it was sort of a new burgeoning, kind of blossoming kind of a, of a movement that people are really excited about, the Academy was in particular, at this time. Um, but also, it was also typical in the sense that, you know, ever since the 60s, there was always sort of one movie that was kind of a British movie that was nominated, that sort of got that support of the British uh, at the side of the Academy and pushed it over the edge. Um, and I think during this period of time, it was the British movies, but also the Irish movies, because they were sort of the political, interesting, historical movies from over the pond that were being well-respected and made. Yet that being said, I think In the Name of the Father is kind of forgotten because, yes, it's tied to Daniel Day-Lewis, but some of these directors at the time, Jim Sheridan, Neil Jordan, they ultimately didn't pan out the way maybe we thought they would, uh, and I've kind of been left in to being relegated to a historical movement versus actually the filmmakers themselves. So as a result, it's sort of been, I think, forgotten in that sense, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. First, I wanna talk about um, the success of the movie, my thoughts on In the Name of the Father. And I found this movie to be a really strong moving drama with two powerhouse performances at the center of it. And this is a sort of classic movie that we see at the Oscars, even today, get nominated. This sort of lengthy historical drama that has a political edge that really gives sort of the, the cadence to these two great performances. And in many ways, it's an actor's movie. And because the performances are so great, we maybe ignore some of the other elements of the movie. This is a better version of that. but. Oftentimes, I actually don't like those movies, movies that are just actor focused, that feel like kind of plays, that, you know, they always have great performances in them, but you know what I'm talking about every year, where we talk about them for the Oscars because they have great performances, but we may not have talked about them otherwise because the movies are generally traditional or not that interesting or maybe a little bit generic. But sometimes the acting performances on display are so undeniable, so magnanimous, so magnificent, uh, that you have to just be in awe. And I think this is one of those scenarios, that the two performances at the center, here being Dale Day-Lewis and Pete Postlewaite, are so undeniable, so terrific, um, that they demand you to see the movie. And it's always an impossible task to crown someone one of the greatest actors of all time. But anytime someone brings up Daniel Day-Lewis, it's kind of undeniable. It's hard to argue the fact that he's one of the greatest or, or the greatest because he has so many of these great performances and so many varied performances. And I think In the Name of the Father is a real key one for me, particularly of this sort of early period, Last of the Mohicans, My Beautiful Andrette, My Left Foot kind of a, of a period of Daniel Day-Lewis because it really sort of brings, I think, the, the dual elements of Dale, uh, Day-Lewis, which is his sort of powerful strength and, and charisma and sort of intensity, but also sort of his empathetic nature and sort of revealing the human side to his characters, which he's always able to do that intensity, but also sort of the earnestness and the sensitivity um, that he's so great at. And his character really sort of maneuvers from madness to frustration to recklessness to 
you know, being at peace to being, you know, overwhelmed. I mean, his character goes through this incredible arc based on, you know, this, this true story of this man who was wrongfully imprisoned. You know, I talked about this being a, a very Irish movie. I mean, it's about a man and his father who gets sentenced wrongfully, wrongfully imprisoned um, for a bombing, an IRA bombing that they didn't do. Uh, so, you know, and then how it sort of leads to a courtroom drama after that. So it's a very political movie in that sense. But really, like I said, I think it's the performances and the, the true story of this man that has to go through so much. And we see it all through Daniel Day's performances. But then on the other side, a Pete Postlewaite is, is equally as good. I mean, he outclasses Daniel Day in, in certain scenes as well. His ability to sort of come back with an equal amount of intensity. And he's just got one of those great faces that feels like he's been through so much and he's seen through so much. And because this is a father-son relationship, you know, to see the, the father seeing how his son sort of end, uh, turns out and the way he sees himself in him and how it, his, you know, he's a man of not a lot of sympathies, <laughs> um, you could say, but he's still a man who cares for his son, but sort of his, his ability to be mad at him, but also care for him, but also not want to see him in the same situation that he's ended up in. And this kind of battle within the two characters, and he really is an interesting character. And we get to see a lot of that, sort of the vulnerabilities that he's ultimately trying to hide. And Pete really communicates that. I mean, like I said, still goes toe to toe in those screaming matches with Daniel Day in, you know, which is just, you have to watch. It really is a have to watch kind of a movie just for those scenes. So in the bits in the middle are really sort of developing that relationship. But then when we get to the courtroom drama in the second half of the movie, it does allow Jim Sheridan to be a little bit more stylistic and really does these great extreme close-ups to build out that tension and the way he's able to edit through all different reaction shots and the sort of relief or the tension or the anger and, and throughout the sort of the trial at the end um, is really successful as well and allows Jim to show more of his skill in that sense. The movie is a little bit long at, you know, 135 minutes because it is a weighty historical political drama. It's a, it is a tough sit at times um, because there is no sort of levity to the situation. But I think it's an important movie telling a, an important story uh, and an important period of time a and has these two central performances that, like I said, sometimes performances are really great, but the movie just okay. I actually don't really like those movies because I want more. But this movie, I think, is bringing more. Jim Sheridan is a more talented director than some of the other directors I'm referring to with his camera work. But also, I think the performances are so amazing. You're talking about some of the greatest actors of all time in this movie delivering some classic, classic performances that it's definitely worth your time, despite it being, you know, a, a serious sort of weighty drama. But why was this forgotten? I think in one part, like I just mentioned, it is a serious weighty drama. It's not a movie that you want to rewatch and jump back into. It is, you know, heavy in that sense. But last week I talked about what's important. Being tied to something is important. Being tied to a genre, being tied to an actor. So it's like, why does people watch this? Why do people? Why would people watch this movie or rewatch it? A, they watch it because they're a Daniel Day Lewis fan, which makes sense, you know. And go back and rewatch all of his movies and his performances, and he got nominated for this, so yeah, it's going to stand up the test of time for that. But then, two, B, I think it's tied to this historical movement. Unfortunately, though, the historical movie was, movement isn't necessarily taught because in film school there's things like that because it's not wasn't actually a successful movement you know we get something like dogma 95 which was you know created by lars von trier and thomas vinterberg well thomas vinterberg just won you know an oscar for best international film you know he was nominated for best director lars von trier is still in the festival circuit he's still a well appreciated director and that was in 1995 i mean something like the french new wave well we get Truffaut and godard and Agnès varda from them we get amazing directors from those movements but movements but in this movement Neil Jordan, his Hollywood stuff didn't really work out. Now that in Jim Sheridan's, they sort of reverted back to the sort of Irish smaller stuff. Now we get these great actors from them, but I don't even know how many people consider Liam Neeson as a great Irish actor. They maybe kind of forget um, that that's where he's actually from, Northern Ireland. Um, similarly with Daniel Day-Lewis maybe in that respect. So it's an odd kind of movement in that sense that the actors really blossom, but the directors maybe didn't live up to the hype that maybe we thought they would be, you know, getting Best Director and Best Picture nominations. People really thought Jim Sheridan was this great sort of iconoclast director. And he is a great director and done many great things. And, you know, I still think he does great movies. I mean, you know, Neil Jordan still does movies with movie stars, but they're not as well acclaimed as they once were. And because of that, they don't have sort of devoted, you know, fans of their movies necessarily. So they can become a little bit more forgotten.
But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know your thoughts on um, this movie and on the Irish New Wave, we'll call it, and The Crying Game and some of those other movies. Stay tuned to next week. This is going to be a sister episode to next week where we talk about... You know, I wanted to talk about Remains of the Day t today, but we'll talk about it a little bit more tomorrow with the sort of Merchant Ivory kind of style of movies that were so prevalent that are less so today and try to figure out why that is. Uh, but that's about it, guys. Until next time, stay tuned.